And we are back again. Welcome to First Light Talk number nine. The topic of the day is knowing where fish will be, aka how to read water so you will know where fish will be more often than not. And the fish of the day is going to be bass, so aka knowing where bass will be more often than not. Today's Saturday. It is still dark out. It's 49 degrees down here in Florida. It's a colder one down here today. Drinking my Black Rifle coffee. Today I'm drinking Fit Fuel. And it's waking me up to start this podcast early in the morning as I am tired today. But like usual, we are getting into the current news article. And today's article comes from WUSF Public Media. And the article is titled, Florida has a big decision coming up on the chance to catch a really big fish. So this article is talking about Goliath Grouper. And Goliath grouper have been protected since 1990 from overfishing, and they were basically driving the population down to dwindling numbers. And in 1991, the uh, the species was placed on the endangered species list, and then it was listed to a species of concern. And the season was closed for about 30 years, and this year it may change. And there is a proposed plan that would allow up to 200 Goliath grouper to be taken each year via a lottery system. And permits would cost $500 if you are drawn for that lottery. And if you guys don't know what a Goliath grouper is, these fish can grow up to 8 feet in length and they can weigh up to 800 pounds. If you just search up Goliath grouper fishing on YouTube, they are just massive, massive fish. And a lot of times people hook them and the strongest people in this world have a very, very tough time fighting these fish. But a public meeting is approaching where the public can give their input on this proposed plan. And now 30 years later, the the population has recovered to a plentiful number to where the season is now proposed. Now, if this season does come back, uh, I don't think I'll be buying one of these permits or trying to get into the lottery to get one of these permits to be able to keep these fish. I would love to go out and catch one and just say I've done it just to have the fight under my belt and get a picture with this enormous monster. But I don't think I have any interest in keeping one of these fish. But it does look like a very, very fun fish to target. I mean, they eat anything from just any type of massive fish or a whole turkey or a whole chicken you basically just put a giant piece of meat on a hook and lower it to where they live and they're just going to suck it in and you better squeeze that rod for dear life have your buddies hold you so it doesn't yank you in the water and please don't be using anyone else's gear because a lot of times if you are not prepared or strong enough that rod is getting yanked out of your hand and if you're using someone else's gear you're going to owe them a lot of money A lot of money if that grouper yanks this rod out of your hand. But on to today's article on how to read water. So it is often said that 10% of fishermen catch 90% of the fish. There's a lot of people that go out fishing, but they really don't know how to do it. And you guys can be a excellent caster and just cast this lure about 10 miles far. And you guys don't do that well when you go out you may catch one two three fish on a good day but 10 percent of the fishermen catch 90 percent of the fish like when me and rob go out normally we are dominating that river or lake or wherever we are we're normally slang and yes sometimes we do have off days or one day i'm doing better than rob or rob's doing better than me but normally we catch up on each other because we're able to adapt quickly And that's one of the most important things while fishing is once you know what's working, be able to switch up your presentation or your lure pattern or your lure in general or your bait in general. And as long as you can make that switch fairly quickly, it could change your day around in a snap. And fish need three things, cover, food, and diversity or marginal changes. So when we talk about cover, and we are talking about bass today, so largemouth bass. So when we're talking about cover, that could be fallen trees, weed beds, submerged cover, boulders, pilings, a, a sunken car, Christmas trees underwater, just basically anything like that. Um, 
the food that they could be eating crawfish bait fish insects frogs turtles snakes baby birds ducks anything that they're feeding on in that area they could be eating. Um, and marginal changes or diversity changes we're talking about shade lines drop-offs fast water eddies breaks in the fast water cover and open water and generally a lot of this stuff is the same for most of the species out there as long as we're talking about freshwater like if we're talking about st steelhead uh the fast water breaks if you get a slow pool a slow pocket of water out of the fast water there's going to be a steelhead there and if there's large mouth in that river or small mouth in that river then them breaks in the fast water is going to be a key point to look into but a fish is always somewhere for a reason all right yes they are odd outliers to where you just cast a randomly in open water on a random day where there will just be a random fish that takes your lure and you got one on but generally a fish will always be somewhere for a reason whether a weather a weather pattern got them in open water so if it's overcast out whenever it's overcast the fish are going to stray away from their cover so if we want to talk about the different types of weather patterns first so let's talk about the overcast when it's overcast out there's less sun penetration through the water and the fish don't have to be so close to cover because the bait fish aren't staying as close to cover the 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 bass are going to stray away from their cover and search for food they're going to be more active more likely to hit top water depending on the certain time of year and they're going to be more active and more aggressive on overcast days they could see better but that also means the bait fish can see better so there's going to be more aggressive strikes if we're talking about spring summer and fall now if you want to talk about a summer bite to where it's the sun is shining and it's hot these fish are going to be packed up into the shade and they're going to be very close to cover under a tree by a log on the weed lines and generally there's going to be shade mixed into that equation to where if you cast near that shade you cast enough times to more probable locations then you're going to more probably catch more fish and uh, let's get on to a summer day on overcast that's one of the most fun fishing there is when there is a summer day with overcast because that's when they're the most active time of year they're going to be coming out away from that cover and that's when you can throw that top water or moving bait bite and you guys could just have an incredible day then but now if we're talking about a windy day as soon as i see wind i pull out a moving bait and moving bait that, that could be anywhere from a, uh, a spinner bait a chatter bait a crank bait a lipless crank moving bait could technically even be top water and uh, that's when I throw out a moving bait whenever there's wind and whenever there's wind I immediately go to the bank side to where the wind is blowing towards if the wind's blowing to that side of the bank I know that's where most of the more active fish will be that's where all the bait is blowing up against and if I throw that spinner bait along the whole bank that's getting wind blown and if there is wind mixed with a high probable point or cove or down tree just where a fish should be i could almost guarantee i could call out cast i'll be like okay there's a fish off this log cast and just get thunked by a bass more often than not and the key thing about reading water and knowing where bass will be is experience okay you don't want to base every fishing trip off of experience but it's always good to have in the back burner of your mind because if you base every trip from here on out from old experiences then a lot of times you're gonna be always following what you know and your old experiences you won't be following anything new and sometimes that can that can be your crutch for the day because this is always what works for you and you're not willing to try anything new and sometimes you just got to drop everything and try something new. And that's when you learn something new. Now let's get into fall. When we're talking about fall, more often than not, it's going to be a transition period out of the hot summer into the colder weather to where the fish are going to start feeding up. And that's when you're going to get your most active moving bait bites. Uh, you can basically throw a underspin, a spinner bait, a chatter bait. 
that's when people throw a lot of top water. I'm still throwing jigs. Basically, year-round, I'm throwing jigs. I think it's one of the most versatile baits. And um, they're always going to be on a more predictab- predictable point, no matter what time of year it is. But summer, they're going to be close to cover norm- more often than not if it's going to be hot out. Overcast, they stray away from the cover. Fall, that's more often a feeding time. So that's when you throw all like the bait fish patterns and that kind of stuff. And fall is still dependent on the temperature. So if it's a cold front, then it's going to be a little bit tougher a bite. And if it's hot and sunny out and it's like 80 degrees in the fall, you could basically back that up to like a summer pattern to where they're going to be closer to cover, maybe off a little bit on the wind breaks, on that whole thing. One of the key things for me is this diversity marginal changes. So if you have fast water to slow water again, if you have a shade break mixed with a point coming out of the water, and you got wind blowing on one side of that point with a big shade break there, if you got all of these things lining up, I'm going to cast to the point side that has that is wind blown and has the shade. Maybe there's a log on that side too. Every time you drop in one of these key things, you could almost guarantee there's going to be a fish there. So instead of just going out there and just casting into random open water, make yourself in a better position to where you're going to be more often to catch a fish than not catch a fish, or at least get a bite. And what I like to say is you cast primarily at the probable places, then your chances are definitely going to go up. Instead of just casting randomly, you cast at all the probable locations. Like if you cast at every down tree and every submerged bush and piling and cove and windbreak, then instead of just casting randomly in the open water, then your chances are going to go up. A great fisherman does not need a fish finder to generally know where the fish are going to be. They will always be able to catch fish. All right. Do fish finders help? Absolutely. Absolutely. If you guys can afford a fish finder and it's in your budget range, any fish finder is better than no fish finder. But I used a $80 fish finder from Cabela's for many years just on one of my Pelican kayaks. It wasn't a bougie fish finder. It wasn't a bougie kayak. It was basically like the beginner fish finder and kayak. And I still slay on that kayak to this day. I've had this kayak for 10 years while Rob has basically upgraded to the Cadillac of kayaks. But we both keep up with each other. I mean, now he, he'll just do laps with around me with his trolling motor on his kayak and he'll get to them places. But if you took that kayak away from him, he'll still be able to still, still be able to catch fish. And if I upgraded to that kayak, I'd catch just as many fish as I would on the kayak I'm on now. But a great fisherman does not need a fish finder. They generally know without a fish finder, the probable locations, but knowing where like drop offs will be. And if you're looking at the fish finder and you see a big bait ball underwater and you have fish moving towards it, or if you see a submerged tree underwater, then that's where the fish finder really comes in handy. But having sunglasses is one of the biggest, most basic advantages a fisherman can have. And I still see people going fishing without polarized sunglasses. It's amazing to me. All right, there's so many times where we'll be out fishing, and whether it's trout or bass or pike or musky or you name it, we'll be fishing and we're doing our cast and doing our casting, and we spot just a massive fish underwater that's not spooked, and we cast at it and we catch that fish. Versus if we don't have sunglasses on, we won't see that fish at all, and we'll just cruise right past it, and we miss out at, at an opportunity at a fish. That will probably eat. Having polarized sunglasses is the biggest advantage. And it's the most basic advantage. It's like the most simplest thing that you could think of. Having sunglasses on. And until you guys realize this. That 90% of water is basically dead water. So if you take a giant lake. You take 90% of that water. It's going to be dead water. So 10% of water holds all the fish. And if you guys pick up on a pattern early, so if it's a normal hot day and it's been a generally the same weather for the past week 
and you go out on let, let's just say a late summer day and the sun is up it's like 85 90 degrees and there's a couple clouds in the sky so it's not a bluebird uh frontal day you pull up on any submerged tree and you cast a jig into there you'll get a bite and then you keep doing that and you get another bite and another bite and another bite but this is where people also fall into the trap of only throwing that pattern all day long when if you see something change like let's say the breeze picks up and you feel that little breeze on your neck go by you and you see a little bit of ripple in the water pushing past these trees and stuff and then you pick up a spinning bait cast it past that bring it back the submerged tree and your your bite ratio might pick up from there as well the biggest part of a fisherman is being adaptable to change quickly so these bass tournaments if you are falling behind and you don't pick up on the change quickly people will do laps around you before you even blink All right you need to be adaptable quickly and another thing with their food and their forage if you could recognize their forage and match the hatch to improve your chances then that is just a whole nother advantage you could have and whether it's polarized sunglasses to where you're looking into the water and you see the bait fish that they're eating so you'd be like okay well there's crayfish out first off so i know they're eating crayfish right now or if you see like a mullet uh, swim by or a shiner swim by you'd be like, okay that's what they're eating and if you guys get your hands on one of them like take a little net and net them up and you'd be like okay this is what they kind of look like they're more silverish with a little bit of blue tint and then you put on a jerk bait and match it to the t then obviously your chances are going up because you're fooling them with their forage and a lot of times if you could just catch one fish when the bite's tougher and sometimes if they throw up what they've been eating because they're trying to get away and sometimes they think throwing up will help them get away because the jig is stuck in their mouth and they don't know how to get it out so when they're in the boat and they're throwing up their forage you'd be like oh they're eating shiners or they're eating bluegill and it's basically just a simple thing that's another tip that will help you catch more fish um learn a fish's behavior and what they want and what they're looking for and that's when fishing becomes very very easy because if you know just by walking out your front door in the morning that a front just pushed through it was more cold than it's normally been it, it was a random very cold night and you walk outside and it's a blue bird nice warmer day then you know it's going to be a cold front day but you should have the knowledge and have done enough research online or watching youtube videos or just experience in general that first off it's going to be a tougher tougher bite because a front just pushed through there's not a cloud in the sky the sun's up fish are going to be deep and depending on how quick the water warms up the fish will they might push up into the shallows to where they're soaking up as much sunshine as they could and if there starts becoming like a little bit of a breeze the clouds start pushing in and you could just go out there late afternoon once the water's warmed up hit them shallow pockets them shallow coves you throw a spinner bait through there you're probably going to do very well that day there's been many times where me and rob uh we start getting the fishing itch where we have to get on the canoe by march 1st because the ice just cleared up we just can't wait to catch some largemouth bass in north jersey but we go out there and the first five trips of the year it's like learning the bite all all over again because it's still cold they're not really in their spring pattern really at all yet but they're pushing up into these shallows to get heat and a lot of times when you think winter bass fishing that the bass are going to be deep that's more often than not where they're going to be they're going to be deep but a lot of times on these oddly warm days in the spring they will push up uh, into the shallows or push up against a rock wall that gains a lot of heat and that's what they're looking for at that time of year is heat and food and when you catch a big bass in the winter they are going to be fat like baseballs and their gut is just going to be huge and that's one of the most fun times of the year to fish when you could actually get into an absolute monster fish whether you're throwing big swim baits or you're throwing jigs slow crawling something if you could catch 
a sizable fish in the winter, it's going to be just fat. Like he just pigged out for a Thanksgiving meal and he was a glutton and just couldn't stop eating. It's just a very fun time. But we go out there in the winter and we may only catch five fish for about, let's just say four hours because we're bouncing around. Are they deep? Are they shallow? We don't know. And then one experience really clicks in my mind from our past to where we did this for about four or five hours. We went out there at first light and we fished until like one or 2 p.m. And we're like, man, we don't know. It's been a tough day. We're hungry. We're, we're a little cold. Let's just go back in. And we're looping around this one island of where we always fish. And the wind picked up and it's blowing all into this one cove. And it's just, it's probably 10, 15 mile an hour winds at that point of the day. And it's blowing into this cove. But it's still a little chilly, but the sun's beating down. It's been beating down all day with no wind. And Rob had a great idea to go into this cove with a gold spinnerbait, gold-bladed spinnerbait. And he goes in there, first cast to the back of the cove, pulling it out, smacks one. And then I'm like, okay, cool. They're back in here. I flip a jig, whack one. And we just went on a killing spree of him murking them on the, spin, the spinnerbait, me catching them on the jig, and I think we ended up with like 10 fish each that day just by pulling out of this cove and hitting one wall face that's along this cove because the wind's blowing in there. That's where the bait's going. So we mixed up the bass looking to feed up and fatten up through the winter months and gaining the most amount of heat they possibly can. This cove that was back in there, it was like a muddy bottom a dark muddy bottom that radiated a lot of heat because it was dark and it sucked in all that sunshine. So we mixed that up. We mixed a margin change with their food and the rock wall. And there was also a lot of lily pad cover from the previous year. And there's down trees back in there as well. So we had the perfect scenario, a marginal change, food pushed into a corner and cover back in the cove. And that's all you could look for. We were adaptable very quick. We went from having like two to three fish each to having 10 fish each just like that within a half hour. And that's how you have to look at all these lakes and ponds. And if you're river fishing for bass, me and Rob could basically go out and we could almost guarantee you we will at least catch a bass because we are looking at the most probable places that the fish will be laying along a log along a bush, on a weed line, on a shade line. It's very basic once you learn all the basics, all right? And a lot of the basics you can just learn from reading, but you have to incorporate your reading into the field at some point or another. I still see people that, that are diehard fishermen that only catch like one or two fish a trip, and it amazes me that they're still not picking up on these things. I went out fishing yesterday, and... It was super windy on this bigger lake than I normally fish from the shore. I was bank fishing down here in Florida, and it was a pretty sizable lake, and I was bank fishing it. And I pull up with a spinnerbait, and I immediately catch, like, a one-pounder. I'm like, all right. But I fished this lake before, and me, always knowing that the fish are going to be off this one pipe that holds all the bait fish, that's where the fish are going to be, I immediately go to that pipe to get get on my first fish, get on my first couple of fish and just start hammering them. I go to that pipe. I pull one fish off the pipe and I'm like, well, this is where I normally catch all the fish, but the wind is blowing from the pipe all the way to the other end of the lake where I know there's a big point and a cove that basically starts like an eddy and a, like a circle in that big cove because of that point. And I make my way over there, throwing a spinner bait, throwing a jig, throwing um, a big swim bait. I just start hammering on the fish. Just start hammering on them. I immediately picked up the fish weren't on that pipe. I didn't waste a lot of time there. I spent like five minutes there. I shot across the lake. And when I say shot across the lake, I had to hike about three quarters of a mile to get to this point. But I knew it was going to be the ticket. And when I knew the wind was blowing into that cove, and I could basically see that the eddy. I could see the eddy was forming and where the bait was busting. And I picked up on my change quickly. I didn't waste a lot of time. 
and I threw the right baits at the time of day. Windy, I always throw a moving bait, and then once the moving bait kind of dies off a little bit, that's when I switch to a, a jig or a slower crawler creature bait. That's when I switch up, but I always start with a moving bait on a windy day. So I shot over there, caught a bunch of fish. I think the biggest I caught was like a four, four-ish pounder, and the gators started moving in because I was catching so many fish, so I ended up boogieing out of there. And uh, you just got to be able to adapt fairly quickly if you want to change your day around very quickly. So be the 10% of fishermen and catch 90% of the fish, right? Change up your year with bass fishing. Do a lot of research online. And if you have found anything new or interesting in this podcast, please give it a share. Show your buddy if you guys are having trouble fishing to say, hey, Listen to this podcast. Listen to what he's got to say. And let's implement it this time when we go out. And just if you are learning all these tips and tactics to where trying to figure out how the wind pertains to the shade and the cover and the drop-offs and the whole nine, then just go slow about it your next trip out. Really try to understand why fish are where they are. Um, when you go out and you pull up on a log and you cast as close to the log as possible, and then your line just jumps, and you set the hook, and it's a decent-sized bass, say, why was that bass there? Was it for cover? Was it for shade? Blah, blah, blah. Then if you're casting on open water, and you hook up, say, why was that fish there? Was it a drop-off with a weed line, and they're just sitting on that weed line waiting for something to swing by? Just try to understand why fish are there, and will it improve your mind for the future if you run into these same situations um that is basically it guys uh i hope you enjoyed this flt talk number nine how to read water and know where the fish will be uh have a great day tune in tomorrow for flt number 10 enjoy your coffee this morning or if you're out duck hunting like some of my buddies are today i hope you guys get on a get on your limited ducks or if you're out fishing catch a big fish it's still winter bow in certain states, especially in New Jersey. Good luck to all my New Jersey winter bow hunters out there. Drop your biggest buck of your life this this hunt today. And I am Mike with Obviously Outdoorsman. Enjoy your coffee and get to work. Still hit the gym. I don't care. It's Saturday. Get out there. Shred that muscle up to rebuild. All right, guys. I am Mike. Peace. Oh, this coffee is so good.